Uh, as Colin said, we are uh, starting our series in Haggai, and so this, uh, this sermon is an overview of all of Haggai, and over the next eight weeks we'll be digging into smaller passages uh, together as a church. Uh, it's a day, I don't know, uh, well, earlier in the week, the thought of starting Haggai was not that exciting, but now that I've got to spend time in it, I actually really love it. It's kind of like the first day of the school year, or the first day of the new uh, football season, you get really excited. Uh, it'll be quite similar to um, seasons or school years gone before, of course, but there's something exciting about getting to come to something new. Now, as we go through Haggai, we're going to see a lot of things that we'll see in pretty much any other book of the Bible. We will see who God is, what he is like, and we will see what he calls his people to. We will see the effects of sin, of rebellion against God. We will be pointed, I hope, towards who Jesus is and what he has done, and will be given hope for a future. Now, you can find all those things in any book of the Bible. Uh, but getting to go uh, to a new book, it's sort of like getting a slightly different angle on a beautiful diamond. If Christ is this beautiful diamond, when we go to any book of the Bible, we see a slightly different angle to see how wonderful and how glorious he is. And so for this next, uh, this week and in eight weeks going forward, I really hope you see how wonderful Jesus is. I really hope uh, that we will hear God speak to us as he spoke to the people through Haggai. Uh, for this overview uh, sermon, uh, we're going to go through, uh, it will be a little different to, to a normal sermon. So it's going to be a little while until I read uh, the passage, and the passage will just be the whole of Haggai uh, for today. Uh, the future of the passages will just be like three or four verses. And we're going to ask uh, five big questions. Now uh, these are the questions you learn in primary school when you're learning how to write newspaper articles. It'll be the who, what, why, where, and when. Uh, it'll be slightly different order. Uh, first we're going to ask why. Uh, why does the book of Haggai exist? We're going to ask when. Uh, when did this take place? Who? Who is Haggai and who are the people that he is writing to? We'll ask what. And at that point we'll come to read our passage and we'll highlight a few uh, things that stand out across the whole uh, of the book. And then we'll end with where. Not just a where does this take place, that's quite simple, but we'll ask the question, where is Christ in Haggai? And I'll point out a few things. Uh, pretty much uh, everything uh, that I will say today will go into a lot more depth in as the series goes on. This is, uh, as I said, just an overview of Haggai. So that first question, why? Why is there a book of Haggai? Why did God feel the need to speak through to his people through Haggai? Uh, if you actually have a Bible, you can open it to Haggai, and we won't read it all yet, but I'll point out some things as we go. And the clue to why Haggai exists is in chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Uh, Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills, and bring woods, and build the house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. In there, he gives us the purpose of why he is calling the people to build the house, that he may take pleasure in it, and that he may be glorified. That is, uh, if you take a big zoom out, that is the reason that God spoke to Haggai, that he would be pleased, and that he would be glorified. Now, if you're then to zoom in, the reason that God does not feel pleased and is not being glorified, well, there are two reasons. The first, is that the mission of God's people has completely stopped. As they have been, uh, they have just come out of exile, and they have returned uh, to their land, and they are told to build the house of the Lord there, to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. Now the temple, uh, and right throughout the passage, will be called the house of the Lord, where God would dwell. Yet for years now, they have paused their work. Uh, You will have seen uh, in verse two, uh, the Lord uh, says, Uh, that the people say. The people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. What the people have done is they had had forgotten to build the house of the Lord and instead they had just built their own houses, panel houses, it calls them. They had been freed from exile by God and yet they have already forgotten him. The priority has not been at all on him and his glory and his pleasure but solely on their own. So God is displeased. God is not glorified. Now, the other reason uh, that God is not pleased or glorified is because of who the people of Israel hold up as their ultimate authority. 
Uh, now in Haggai, the reason that we are told that they stopped building was because they focused uh, on themselves and forgot God. Ezra actually gives us some more clues as to why the building stopped. Uh, so back in Ezra chapter 4, uh, King uh, Artaxerxes, uh, he sends a letter demanding that they stop building that they put down all their tools and stop. And now Artaxerxes, uh, incredibly powerful, of course, quite formidable. And so the people, whose Lord is God, reject what God has told them and follow this other king, putting down their tools. God is not pleased or glorified because he is not, he, they are not honoring him as king. They are honoring another. For us, I think as we um, come to look at Haggai, if we were to ask the question, well, why should we read Haggai? What are we going to get from it? I think it will probably speak most, it will speak to all of us, but it will speak most to those who have maybe been a Christian for quite a while. And perhaps that passion for the Lord Jesus sometimes runs a little dry. I'd actually like you to take a minute just to reflect. Reflect on your life as a Christian. The ups and the downs, and consider particularly how has your affection for Jesus grown or waned over the years? Take just a minute. I suspect as you think on your affection for Jesus, uh, you'll know there are times where very naturally you feel completely on fire for him and there are uh, times when that's perhaps not the case. For the people of Israel in this moment, their passion for the Lord has waned. They have forgotten him. And so they are encouraged in this book to return to him. And so for us, no matter uh, how strong or how weak your affection for Christ Jesus is at the moment, I hope this book will draw us back to him that the Lord will speak as he did uh, back then to us, to help us return to him. That's considering this on an individual level and our own affection for Jesus. But I'd also love for us to consider it on a church level. Uh, I want us uh, to be encouraged, actually, as we consider that. Uh, as a, a new church planted only a few years ago, uh, we are a church, uh, and I'd love getting to, to come here, that is full of energy and life and full of passion for what God is doing in and around Kintour. Uh, every uh, single Sunday morning I come here, I leave feeling incredibly encouraged by getting to be a part of this church. Uh, all the uh, news and work on the building is so exciting. And yet I'm very excited uh, when I see that it's not just uh, hope for a building, but hope that people who don't know Jesus yet will come to know Jesus, and that building might be a part of it, that our church will grow and be strengthened, and the building will be a part of it, but it'll be the church, the people, that grow and are strengthened. We as a church are full of energy, full of passion. And so perhaps Haggai uh, will not be as particularly relevant uh, for us as a church at the moment in terms of passion, but I hope it might be preparation for future years. There may be uh, future years as a church way down the line where the going is a little rougher, when the times are tough, but I hope that the Lord will strengthen us through this, uh, that those times, that we can help us get through those times. Why is the book of Haggai written? That God may be pleased and glorified, as his people continue the mission that he has called them to, and as they obey him as their king. Now when is the book of Haggai written? Uh, if you read verse 1 of chapter 1, uh, it gives you the answer. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month. Actually, four times throughout the book of Haggai, uh, we get some specific days given, uh, and people have been able to work that out. And so it starts in August 520 BC, is when the book of Haggai starts. Uh, the book ends about four months later. Uh, 520 BC uh, is when some of the first people were 
some of the people had returned from exile. Most uh, of the people had been exiled into Babylon. Uh, they return in different stages. Uh, and uh, some are back here now. Uh, if you were here last week, we were in uh, Second Kings. So Second Kings was written while the people were in exile, two people who were in exile, but recorded events uh, about 80 years or so before this happened. And before. These are people uh, who have just returned from exile. Uh, who then, uh, who wrote this and who did he write to? Uh, well, it was written, uh, we think, by Haggai. He doesn't put his name on it, uh, but there's no reason for anyone else to have written it. And it's written to uh, the people of God who have returned from exile, as we said already. Those are the, the first three questions, and the second ones would be uh, the what and the where. And just to start with the what, uh, I'm going to read the whole book for us. Uh, so it's 38 verses, it'll take about five minutes. Also, to read, please do have it open in front of you so you can follow along as we do this. And as I read it, I would love for you to take note of what stands out. Uh, there may be a particular verse or two, and that's great, but I'd really love for you to see uh, what stands out as a running theme throughout the book. What do we hear time and time again? What are God's priorities in this book? So, from Haggai 1 verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Thus says the Lord of hosts, These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet, is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the hills and bring wood and build a house, that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hill, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, for what the ground brings forth, on man and beast and on all their labor. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnants of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirits of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and of the spirits of all the remnants of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord, the Lord of hosts, their God, on the twenty-fourth day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. In the seventh month, on the twenty-first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnants of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong. O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak the high priest. 
Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, so the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. On the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priests answered and said, No. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priests answered and said, It does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, So it is with, his pe with this people, and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day on, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck you in all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. The word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the twenty-fourth day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth, and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations, and overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Amen. I wonder what uh, did stand out to you uh, as you heard that. Uh, one of the things for me is how often they decide to say the complicated names. I feel like he's named them uh, about six or seven times, then once would have been enough for English words. Uh, but there are three uh, really important and precious things that stand out for me in this passage that I want us to highlight. Uh, because these will come up again time and time again as we go through Haggai. There are, of course, more, uh, but here are three. The first is the preciousness of the Word of God. The second is identifying God as the Lord of hosts. The third is the Lord's presence with his people. And so we'll take each of those in turn. The first then, the preciousness of the Word. If you were to just glance uh, again at the first few verses of chapter 1, time and time again you will hear the phrase something like, Thus says the Lord. Or thus says the Lord of hosts. Time and time again, the Lord speaks. Consider for a moment, where would they be if the Lord did not speak to them? Well, they would have just continued as they were. The temple would have uh, lay in ruins. Their houses would have been uh, lovely and beautiful. But the house of the Lord would be nowhere. Without the word of God, his people would struggle. His people would achieve nothing. 
consider us as a church or as individual Christians. If it was not for the Lord speaking to us, where would we be? If we were not a church that held on to the word of God, where would we be? If you were to head into town and walk along uh, pretty much any street in the centre of town, you will probably find a building that used to be a church, a place where people worship God, that is now something quite the opposite. And it's actually one of the, the saddest sights to see. And there are lots of reasons why churches, uh, faithful and unfaithful churches, close. But it is also true that a church that loses sight of God's word, that loses the preciousness of God's word, will not prosper. And it will fail. And Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire and Scotland, that so much of our, of our church landscape is a testament to that. That if you reject the word of God, you will fail. And for the people that Haggai is speaking to, it was not just that they had uh, failed previously to listen to God, but that they had chosen another to listen to instead. And that King Artaxerxes who told them to stop building, they had said, we're going to listen to him rather than God. They feared the king rather than the true king. And so it can be with us that we would uh, be afraid and so we would just listen to the voices that shout loudest even when they go against, and so obviously against, what God has said. And so just thinking very briefly on our culture today, when it shouts out loud about sexuality or gender, or what sin is or what sin isn't, whenever it shouts out so loud, we could be a church that shrinks, that gives it in, that, that falls on God's word and just follows the, the spirit of the age. And we would be a church that fails. But if we are a church that is built on God's word, we will be a church that will hopefully prosper. Or at the very least, a church that will remain faithful to God. We will see time and time again the preciousness of the word of God, the voice of God speaking to his people. And the second thing I wanted to highlight was how God identifies himself in this book. Fourteen times across the 38 verses, God refers to himself as the Lord of hosts. If you're following along in a different kind of Bible, it might have said the Lord of armies. Uh, that can be translated the same. And in saying Lord of armies, it does not just mean uh, the armies we have here, but it is talking about angelic armies. It is talking about the sovereignty of God, that he is the one uh, with all power and all control of all things. And so think uh, for a moment, if you were somebody listening to Haggai, you know that you, uh, or generations before you, have been in exile, uh, conquered by powerful nations, dragged away, uh, your cities ransacked, your people taken away and enslaved. You have no army or strength or might to speak of. And so even now, uh, while you are at a little bit of peace, you'd be living in continual fear of all the nations that surround you. Knowing that any day, if they so wish, that they could come and decimate your people. You'd be living in fear. And so the Lord identifies himself as the Lord of hosts, so that people who are afraid can take comfort in the fact that the Lord is sovereign over all things and all people. The most powerful armies of the world are like a grain of sand in a huge beach compared to the sovereignty and the power of the Lord of armies. And so if you uh, today are a person living in fear, whatever it may be, see that the Lord is the Lord of hosts. See that the Lord is the one who commands all of heaven arm heaven's armies. The, one, the Lord who is the one who is sovereign over all things. Find comfort in who he is. And the third thing for us to see is the Lord's presence with his people. Now look very quickly at verse 13 of chapter 1. Sorry, I think I wrote verse 13, but that was the wrong verse. Uh, the Lord... No, it is the right verse. Sorry. Uh, then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you, declares the Lord. And then as you move into uh, chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. 
according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. God's heart, God's desire for all time is to be with his people. And one of the reasons he is so displeased and is not glorified is because they have made no house for the Lord to dwell in. Could you imagine if you uh, have a house with a guest room in it and you keep the whole house at pristine uh, it is lovely, it's clean, it's beautiful. But you leave the guest room to lie in tatters. What does it then say to a guest you might invite over? Well, it simply says, I don't really want you here. It simply says, I don't really care about you. It says, I care about my own house that I get to enjoy, but this room that is meant to be uh, for guests, I don't care if it's a complete pigsty. That's what the people had done. They had spent all their uh, time and effort on their own houses, leaving the house of the Lord in tatters. And so it says to God, we don't want you with us. It goes completely against God's desire. His desire in Genesis, his desire in Revelation, his desire in the coming of Jesus is to be with his people. It's not only for his pleasure, that God is with his people, but it is also for the good of his people that God is with them. So when God calls people to something, like he has called these people to rebuild the temple, he always surrounds those, uh, those callings, those missions, with the reassurance of his presence and who he is. Now consider Moses speaking to God uh, in Exodus 33. Moses says, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. Now think to, uh, to the end of Matthew 28, the Great Commission. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. As the Lord calls his people to follow him, he reminds them of who he is and that he is with them. And it means that no matter the task, the Lord's people feel, feel empowered because the Lord is the one who is sovereign over all things and the Lord is the one who will carry his people through all things. We see in Haggai that the preciousness of the words, we see the Lord as the sovereign Lord of hosts and we see the Lord's presence with his people. And that leads on to our final question of where. Where is Christ in Haggai? And now as we come to all the prophets, uh, we know uh, that Jesus fulfills the prophets. Uh, the prophets uh, had a purpose. God spoke to them to then speak to the people. And it was generally to restore the people to what they were meant to be. That is, people who walked with God. Time and time again, if you, if you look at the history of Israel, you see uh, a, a bit of a roller coaster. They followed God for a short period of time and then they would reject him. God would then uh, send a prophet to try and call the people to repentance. And often they would end up uh, just rejecting the prophet, continuing to walk in darkness. And Jesus fulfills the prophets and that he also uh, calls his people to repentance. But he also perfectly displays what a life brought with God looks like. And there are a few ways that Jesus uh, fulfills what we read in the book of heaven. There are loads, uh, so as we go through the next eight weeks, I will see them in a lot more depth. Uh, but I just want to highlight four uh, for us. The first is that God will be pleased and glorified through his son. I said uh, that God's pleasure and glory is the reason behind the book of Haggai. That is why it exists. And God's uh, pleasure and glory are right up there as the top of, G of God's priorities. And God is pleased and glorified through his son. Consider the word spoken at Jesus' baptism. Uh, the Lord uh, God says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And consider the end of Jesus' life as he goes to the cross. And consider how that is prophesied in Isaiah 53. Yet it was the will of the Lord, and most translations would say, it pleased the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. 
He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. God is pleased and glorified through the death of his Son on the cross. Because in that God's people are saved. In that God's desire to be with his people comes to fruition. As the temple, as it was in that day, as the curtain in the temple is torn in two, as Jesus dies, the Lord who wants to be with his people invites his people in to be with him. God is pleased to, to crush his son for the sake of the people that he loves. God is also glorified for the death of his son, because God is glorified when God is seen. And if you were to um, if you were to study a person, if you'd be able to see every thought that they had, everything they ever did, you would quickly realise that that person is probably not that special. That they say and think some, uh, some pretty horrible things. The more you see a person, the more you see flaws. But with God, it is the opposite. As we peel back the layers of God, we will never see any weakness or anything uh, that would make us go, ugh. We just see how wonderful he is. God is glorified as he is seen. And as the cross is seen, as the scene of the cross uh, is seen, we see God display his glory. We see his love on display as Jesus Christ dies for sinners. We see his justice as sin is paid. We see his wrath poured out. We see his mercy given to us. As we look at the cross, we see the glory of God as Jesus dies for his people. God is pleased and glorified through his son Jesus. And second, Jesus is the one who restores the temple. Now consider uh, Jesus entering the temple. Uh, the people have exchanged uh, this house of the Lord for, uh, they have uh, ended up extorting and robbing people. It is no longer a place of worship, but a place of money making. Jesus goes in, he flips over the tables, he, he charges them all out of the temple, returns it to a house of prayer. Now of course, as Jesus uh, did that, he did it once. And I'm sure uh, that again, people uh, entered the temple to extort and to rob. But Jesus will one day ultimately restore the temple. Uh, here uh, are some words from towards the end of Revelation. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb. The people of Haggai's mission is to rebuild the temple. And they get to it. But then it is destroyed about 500 years later. In Jesus Christ, though, there is He becomes the temple and He restores it. Its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. The third thing, uh, the th third place we see Jesus, is that Jesus is the one who brings the presence of God. And right throughout Haggai, uh, we see that God desires to be with his people. We see how wonderful and comforting and beautiful that is. And when Jesus enters the scene, he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. The physical display of God's desire to be with his people is seen in Jesus Christ. And as Jesus uh, goes on to depart, and we spent a lot of time seeing this in John 14 to 17, he promises the Holy Spirit. Chapter 2, verse 5 of Haggai talks of my spirit remaining in your midst. In Jesus Christ coming to us, he is God with us. And as Jesus departs, he leaves God with us as well. Jesus fulfills Haggai in that he brings the presence of God. And then finally, Jesus fulfills Haggai because Jesus destroys his enemies. Now look at the very last verses of Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel. Governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth, and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations, and overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. God is promising a people in fear of enemies that he will destroy them. But we know that enemies rose up again. But as Jesus Christ destroys his enemies, they will never rise up. They will never have the power that they had before. 
1 Corinthians 15 says the last enemy to be defeated is death. Of course, as Jesus rises again from the grave, death is defeated, its sting is gone. It cannot hold him, and so it cannot hold all who come to trust in Jesus. Yet we know that death still does sting. That death still does hurt, that death still does come to us. But we are promised too that Jesus will ultimately fulfill this one day, as written in Revelation chapter 20. Satan is thrown into the lake of fire, destroyed, defeated once and for all. Jesus fulfills Haggai, as Jesus is the one who pleases and glorifies God. Jesus fulfills Haggai as Jesus restores the temple. Jesus fulfills Haggai as he brings the presence of God. And Jesus fulfills Haggai as he destroys his enemies. Haggai is an incredibly rich book. Now these are just some highlights from it. I, as we come to, to look at it a lot closer over the next eight weeks, I really want us to come with a heart of openness to what God is saying to us. Some of what he is saying will be hard. He is calling his people to repent after they have forgotten him, and we will hear that call. But much of it is also a comfort and encouragement. That you have a God who longs to be with you. That you have a God who is sovereign over all things. That you have a God who has sent his Son to die on the cross for you and to be raised to overthrow the grave. That you have a God who time and time again speaks to you, feeding you with the gift of your word that you may stay faithful to him. We will be called to repent, to turn from what is wrong and evil and rubbish, to look at a God who is beautiful and faithful and pure and beautiful. Let's pray to that God now. Father, we thank you that you are a God who longs to speak to us. That years and years ago you spoke to your people through the prophet Haggai. And that we can learn from that now. We thank you that you have spoken to your people through your son Jesus. We thank you that you speak to us through your spirit. Lord, would we be a people that are eager to listen, to learn, to grow, to change, to repent, to turn towards your Son, Jesus. Lord, we thank you that he fulfills the book of Haggai, that he has pleased you and glorified you, that he has enabled us to be with you now and forevermore. Lord, help us to rest in that and to trust in that and to delight in that, and to delight in Him. Amen.